Hello students and welcome to Excel at English, which is a YouTube channel devoted to providing you with informative and analytical video lessons on A-level and GCSE English texts. In this video lesson, we're going to look at exploring multimodal texts, and this particular lesson is aimed at A-level students studying the A-level language and literature course. The objective of the unit is to understand how meanings are conveyed in texts combining visual and written modes of communication, texts that we would describe as multimodal. And this understanding of multimodal texts we are going to apply in later lessons to two texts from the Paris Anthology. Those are French Milk by Lucy Nisley and Not for Parents Paris by Kay Lamprell. If you're interested in analysis of those texts, then please check the playlist in the channel because I will be uh, putting up uh, guided annotations and a detailed analysis of both of those texts. So let's think about, let's begin by thinking about what a mode is. A mode is a way of communicating and modes are not just linguistic. There are two main linguistic modes, the spoken mode and written mode, and you may know something about the contrast between those two kinds of, uh, of language. If you don't, again, check the playlist uh, because I have lessons on um, spoken mode uh, that will help you to understand. But there are non-linguistic modes of communication, and these can include visual, auditory, or gestural modes of communication, and different uh, text forms, or different cultural forms, different genres use these modes in mixed ways. If we look at the example of the opera there, Here's an example um, of a text or a cultural form that's operating on uh, through multiple modes of communication. Um, of course, an opera, um, much like a drama, um, uh, much like a drama performance, will have a script. Um, it will have uh, there'll be lyrics or a libretto um, that will um, have language. So there's a linguistic mode to the communication, but there's also, of course, a musical mode to the communication in that it has music written to go with it as well. Um, but you aren't just listening to it, you're there watching it, so there's a visual mode to communication in terms of the stage design, the costumes. So we can think about um, different forms of communication as mixing many different modes. Um, this brings us to uh, ideas about signs, um, and the study of signs is called semiotics. And here, Ferdinand de Saussure, who was one of the fathers, uh, the founding fathers of semiotics, um, describes semiotics as a science studying the role of signs as part of social life, and linguistics being only one branch of this general science. Um, I wonder what de Saussure would have made of this uh, communication that takes place almost exclusively in emojis. I think um, he would have understood um, that how, how this worked within his own theories about the way that we communicate using signs. Um, signs don't have to be linguistic. L uh, linguistic signs are only one way of communicating. That brings us to the language level of graphology, which in some, which is probably um, the most underused of the language levels, and for good reasons, which we'll discuss later. I like to think of graphology in terms of how texts create their own distinctive visual register, uh, the aspects of a text that perhaps um, create a, a distinctive uh, visual tone. Um, graphology language level refers, of course, to the appearance of texts on the page. Um, as students of language, we're interested in the way that uh, visual appearance and language interplay. Um, within graphology, there's a key distinction between typography and orthography that you should be aware of. And the typography is the study of textiles, fonts and lettering, where orthography is the study of conventions in spelling and grammar and punctuation. Um, different texts have their own distinctive typographies and orthographies. Different genres perhaps have their own distinctive typographies and orthographies. And um, in graphology, that's what we will be studying. There's a very useful a blog post there um, from uh, the English language uh, blog um, that I suggest that you look up on Google and read. Uh, I found that a useful resource. Um, how do we write about graphology? Well, there are other graphological elements uh, beyond typography and orthography that can work in conjunction with language to create meaning. And these include things like color, logos, pictures, perspectives, positioning and layout and space. Um, 
you may notice that I changed the slide design here and I did that um, because I, I wanted to try and illustrate the point about um, graphology being a visual register. Um, to me there is something a lot more formal about this slide design compared to the previous slide design that I was using. Um, and well how is that formal, um, regi formal visual register created in this um, in this particular slide design? Well, I suppose there's the traditional connotations of wood. There are um, type, uh, typo typographical aspects to the font here, which is um, altogether a much more serious font. There's a lot more kind of clean white space. Uh, there are various ways in which I could analyze the visual register of this slide compared to the previous slides. Um, don't worry, I will return to the previous slides. This one's horrible to read. Um, there's a note of caution at the bottom here, though, and we have to, as A-level students, be aware that we are not design critics and that we don't look at text design um, and layout in abstraction from language. We only need to analyse graphology where it corresponds to language usage. And a good analysis of, uh, of uh, graphology is what I would think of as a complementary um, language level to analyse. In terms of um, you're going to be able to make um, effective points about graphology, about visual presentation, in the way that they correspond to the language in the text. Um, if you end up just interpreting colour, just interpreting layout, then you've strayed away from language analysis um, and you are creating a, an essay on text design, which is not likely to do you any favours in an exam. Um, back to our, um, to, our, to our perhaps more comfortable uh, format here, to our slightly wacky visual register, let's think about the way that image and word combine in texts. Um, as I've already mentioned, we're interested in the interplay between linguistic and non-linguistic modes. So have a look at this short extract uh, and ask yourself um, how this combines image and word to create meanings. This is a little extract from one of my favourite uh, comic subgenres, which is the 1950s and 60s romance comic. Um, I just love those. I just love that fantastic portrayal of traditional gender values. Um, and here we see our, our, our young female protagonist. Obviously, she's um, in love with a guy who she's worried doesn't love him back. Let's think, uh, as you pause the video, about aspects like the setting, the representation of thought, narrative device, but particularly how the interplay between what you can see and what you can read is combining to create meaning. Some interesting features in this short little extract. Um, most importantly, I think that the interplay between narrative and direct thought in this um, short comic is a useful way of illustrating how visual and linguistic aspects can combine to present meaning. Um, two more days of loneliness passed, still no Neil. He can't be angry with me for breaking one date. We have a, a contrast here between the narrative, which is presented in the caption above, and the direct thought, which is presented in the thought bubble. Um, that's presented visually through the caption and the thought bubble and the way that they're spaced within the panels. But it's also presented linguistically in that there's a register difference uh, between these two kinds of language in the text. The narration is in the past tense, it's reflective. Um, the thought bubble is in contrast in the present tense. There's also a difference in the formality of this register. Uh, the narration is perhaps uh, more formal and is an example of um, a written mode of communication, whereas the thought bubble contains um, features of perhaps a spoken mode. It's more reminiscent of dialogue. There's fragmentation, um, there's uh, repeated exclamations, um, there are other features of informal spoken language. So there's a combination there of visual and linguistic ways of communicating um, not just this character's thoughts at the time, but also her kind of reflective position or this storytelling voice that's, I guess, above the action of the text. 
There are other aspects here that we might consider. We might think about the perspective and the way that the panels are focused um, very closely on her facial expression. We might think about the particular setting which is established visually um, of her presumably lying in bed gazing at this photo uh, and how that setting uh, works to interplay with language. We also could think about the typology. There's a couple of um, emboldened um, emboldened uh, words there which functions I guess again as a, as a feature of spoken language in adding a kind of almost a vocal stress or emphasis to particular words. So useful to consider in this short extract how the visual and the linguistic are combining to present meaning and that's what, the, what we'll need to do in order to really get a grip on some of those texts in the Paris Anthology. Um, thinking more broadly about mixed mode genres, um, I'm focusing very much on the um, kind of the comic genre in this, but there are much uh, the multimodal texts um, are, are ubiquitous. They are everywhere. Um, we have examples such as infographics and photo journals and comics, of course. Uh, many child directed texts are multimodal. Um, when you learn to read, you do so with the support of pictures because they add additional context. And these clues um, help you uh, to learn as a reader or help you to interpret the language that you're reading. But uh, that isn't to say that texts with pictures are simple texts. Many complex technical texts, of course, um, have pictures and these are equally multimodal. We are focused particularly on the, uh, the kind of the comic, um, the comic genre uh, of writing because that will help us to interpret um, both of our texts in the Paris Anthology and the subgenres within uh, within within the comic genre include cartoons. We might think of um, political cartoons in newspapers or magazines, which are often a single panel. They're often um, grotesque and hyperbolic. They often have a satirical function. We might think of comic strips, which are often these short three or four panel um, strips, um, which usually have um, some kind of a humorous um, or occasionally um, almost uh, moralistic uh, message in them. Uh, they're short entertaining uh, examples. Comic magazines, you may think of Batman, Spider-Man and Superman, the DC and Marvel universes which have now spilled over very, popul uh, very popularly into Hollywood. Um, these, I suppose, are very um, formulaic texts. They uh, exist in the literary tradition of um, hero or quest um, texts, so they're very interesting in that respect. Um, but they're quite formulaic. They have their own really unique, um, unique features. Uh, thwack. I think you probably know what I mean when I say thwack. Um, however, the comic genre or the comics. Um, Kind of um, genre has expanded in recent decades um, towards literature and it's worth mentioning graphic novels. They are becoming increasingly acknowledged as a form of literature in the strict definition of literature. Um, why is this? Many graphic novels um, are, um, as I say in, in, on this slide, highly original, stylistically unique and provocative. Um, using ingenious narrative techniques, um, pushing the boundaries of um, characterization of theme. A great example of that is this uh, comic no uh, graphic novel, sorry, a Mouse, which is an account of Nazi atrocities in World War II. And that's a really uh, fantastic way of looking at the, the graphic novel as um, an example of literature and I highly recommend that you get yourself a copy of Mouse and read it. It is a compelling read. It's interesting that obviously within the comic subgenre um, the term comic is substituted for graphic, um, possibly um, synonyms, but the connotations of comic in terms of um, comedy, lightheartedness, not to be taken seriously. Um, they ditched that term when describing the graphic novel. Uh, graphic, of course, has connotations of um, perhaps something being very vivid in a more powerful way um, and a much more suitable way of describing these forms of text is to call them graphic novels rather than comic novels.
So in summary then, multimodal texts are texts that convey, me convey meanings through a combination of visual and linguistic modes. There are other forms of multimodal text, um, but the ones that we are going to look at in this unit are uh, visual and linguistic. Uh, the study of layout in written texts is called graphology, or for our purposes, um, we call it graphology within the language levels. And there are two key concepts in graphology. These are typology, the study of text, and orthography, the study of written conventions. We are interested in analysing the way that graphological aspects interplay with language to create meaning. We've also looked at text within the comic genre, and we've already begun to think about uh, unique typological, orthographical and discoursal features that present meaning in comic texts. Um, have a look at the playlist. Uh, the next video up will be an analysis uh, or a guided annotation of French Milk by Lucy Nisley. This channel is Excel English. I hope these, use, these lessons are useful for you uh, in providing good analytical perspectives. Um, please subscribe uh, and follow this channel if you're interested in this kind of content, or even better, send me a message either to say that you found it useful or to request something that you would like me to look at. Thanks and good luck with your studies.